Ah, Proxmox. We love it, right? It's this incredible open source virtualization platform that gives you so much power and flexibility. And it's free. But here's the thing about all that freedom. It comes with a learning curve that can bite back and bite back hard if you're not careful. And that's exactly what we're going to tackle today. We're going to walk through 10 of the most common mistakes people make so you don't have to learn any of this the hard way. So when you really get down to it, what is Proxmox? Is it this amazing blank canvas where you can build literally anything you can dream up? Or is it a minefield just full of hidden traps waiting to corrupt your data and bring your whole system crashing down? It's a question a lot of new users and, you know, even some seasoned pros really have to grapple with. Well, the answer is, it's both. The power is absolutely real, but so are the risks. So think of this little explainer as your map. We're going to point out exactly where all those mines are buried so you can navigate the terrain safely and focus on building something truly awesome. Okay, let's start at the very beginning. We're talking about the foundational decisions you make before you even think about spinning up your first VM. Getting your storage and hardware choices right from the get-go is absolutely critical. Honestly, this is where some of the most uh, disastrous mistakes happen. First up, ZFS. It's a phenomenal file system, no doubt about it, but it is incredibly hungry for memory. So many people jump in, they get excited, set up a massive storage pool, and then they're just scratching their heads, wondering why their entire system is grinding to a halt or worse, just crashing completely. The reason is usually pretty simple. ZFS needs a healthy diet of RAM to function. The rule of thumb here is simple, and trust me, it's non-negotiable. You need about one gigabyte of RAM for every one terabyte of raw storage you're planning to use with ZFS. It's a super simple calculation that can save you a world of pain. Seriously, if your system has under 16 gigs of RAM, you might want to pause and really reconsider if ZFS is the right choice for you. All right, mistake number two. This one's a classic, using RAID Z for your virtual machine storage. Now look, RAID Z is fantastic for storing huge sequential files. Think your Plex Media Library, right? But virtual machines, they are the complete opposite. They're all about tiny random reads and writes happening all over the place. It's like a busy library with people constantly checking out and returning different books, total scattered activity. RAID Z just wasn't built for that, and it creates this massive performance bottleneck. So what's the pro move here? Instead of RAID Z, you really should be using ZFS mirrors. It's basically structured like a RAID 10 setup, and it gives you way better performance and resilience for that random I.O. that your VMs demand. So bottom line, save RAID Z for your bulk storage and backups and keep it far away from your active VMs. Ah, the great debate. You've probably seen it all over the forums, right? You absolutely must use ECC RAM with ZFS or you're just begging for silent data corruption. And look, that advice comes from a good place, but the reality, it's a little more nuanced. It's not quite the doomsday scenario people make it out to be. Let's be really clear about something. ECC RAM doesn't magically prevent memory errors or bit flips. What it does is log them and more importantly, correct them. So if your data is truly mission critical, we're talking business records, irreplaceable family photos, then yeah, you should definitely invest in ECC. But if you're just messing around, running a home lab, a solid tested backup strategy is way more important than obsessing over your memory type. Okay, so now that we've got the hardware foundations sorted, let's move on up to the software level settings. These are the kinds of configuration traps that can totally lock you in, prevent you from migrating VMs, and just completely undermine any high availability plans you might have. This one feels so logical when you first see it. When you create a VM, you can set the CPU type to host. The idea is that you're passing through all of your processor's features for maximum performance. But here's the trap. That VM is now permanently locked to that specific CPU. If you ever want to migrate it to another machine, and that new machine doesn't have the exact same processor, you're completely out of luck. The much smarter move is to choose a more generic CPU model something like x86-64v2 AES. This gives you a fantastic balance of modern features and great performance, but it also preserves that crucial ability to live migrate your VMs between different physical machines in a cluster. Setting up high availability or HA with just two nodes is, well, it's a recipe for disaster. It leads to this nightmare scenario that we call split brain, where both nodes think the other one is down, so they both try to start the same virtual machine at the same time. The result? You get stuck VMs, you can get data corruption, and you get a massive, massive headache. The key to a stable HA setup is something called quorum, and the rule is super simple. 
you need an odd number of votes, and typically that means three. You can do this with three physical Proxmox nodes. Or, if you only have two, you can add a third vote with a lightweight little thing called a Q device running on another machine. Whatever you do, don't skip this. Okay, for our last section, let's talk about day-to-day -day habits. These are the kinds of operational oversights that might not break your system today or even tomorrow, but they are silent killers that almost guarantee a catastrophe somewhere down the line. I know this should be obvious, but it has to be said. Backups are completely non-negotiable. But a real backup strategy is so much more than just clicking the Backup Now button every once in a while. It's about having a complete plan for when things inevitably go wrong. Because let's be honest, a backup you can't restore from is just a waste of disk space. So what does a real strategy look like? It's built on three pillars. Number one, automate your backups. Set them and forget them. Two, store those backups somewhere else, ideally off-site, but at the very least on a different physical disk. And three, this is the one everybody forgets. You have to periodically test your restores to make sure they actually work. I just love this quote from the community. It perfectly sets up our next couple of pitfalls. You'll hear experts say, why would anyone do that when it comes to running extra services directly on the hypervisor? But the truth is, it happens all the time, and it's a huge mistake. And this all leads us to the golden rule and our last few mistakes. Number seven running Docker directly on the Proxmox host. I get it, it seems convenient, but it can create dependency conflicts and stability issues that are an absolute nightmare to troubleshoot. And that leads right into mistake number eight, running any other service on the host. File shares, web servers, you name it. Your hypervisor should be lean, it should be clean, and it should be dedicated to just one thing, running VMs and containers. Put everything else inside a VM. Isolate everything. Number nine, is failing to use a dedicated network just for management and clustering. And finally, the really big one, mistake number 10, exposing the Proxmox web interface directly to the internet. Just don't, please. So after going through all of that, what's the big takeaway here? It really all comes down to understanding the core philosophy of what Proxmox is, and more importantly, how it's meant to be used. You know, it really comes back to this idea we started with. Proxmox is a blank canvas. You have all the freedom in the world to build something powerful and amazing, but you also have the freedom to completely paint yourself into a corner. By understanding these common pitfalls, you're not just avoiding mistakes, you're actually learning the fundamental principles of how to build a stable, resilient system from the ground up. And let's end on this powerful thought. Every single one of these mistakes is preventable. Just take a moment to plan, follow these best practices, and save yourself all that drama because there is truly nothing worse in the world of virtualization than that sinking feeling you get in your stomach when you realize a catastrophic failure was all your own fault.